Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop. This time we're going to be talking about my little bandsaw dovetail cutting jig. I've been using and showing this for uh, since I started making videos and I have gotten questions about this thing so many times over the years and uh, I haven't done a video on making one of these things or kind of how it all goes, but uh, that's what we're doing today. Finally, eight years later, we're going to cover this topic. So if you're not familiar, if you haven't seen me use this before, Here's some footage of it actually being used. It allows you to use your fence in conjunction with this jig to cut the angles for your tails. So this is a great way to quickly and accurately cut all your tails so they're all uniform. And because you're able to flip the piece as you're working, you can make your tails symmetrical if that happens to be what you're going for, which most of the time, most people are. If you have a whole bunch of identical parts, like a whole bunch of drawers that are the same size, you can run all the pieces and make every single cut using the same fence position, just iterating through and make all your cuts that way. So this thing does look fairly simple and for the most part it is, but there is a little bit of uh, details and minutia that we can kind of walk through to uh, actually arrive at something that actually works and is very functional here at the shop, like mine. It's been used for 10 years or 15 or however long it's been since I made this, this silly thing. I'll even show you what this fancy dado on the bottom here is. It's, it's nothing. It's, there's a the scrap I used had a dado in it. <laughs> Let's head over to the bench and we'll talk about dovetail angles first. So to get into dovetail angles, if you're looking at this from a hand tool perspective, you'll typically see those expressed as a rise over run ratio. If you're looking at more of the power tool sides, those are typically going to be expressed more in just straight degrees. For this, we're going to focus on rise over run since that is a little more common especially if you're looking at doing this as a way to sort of complement your hand cut dovetail uh, strategy thing. <laughs> so there are a couple of common ratios and a couple of common thought processes. Uh, you'll see a few ratios, either a one to eight or a one to six. The traditional thought process with that is that a one to eight, which is a shallower angle, is going to be better for hardwoods and I want the six, which is going to be a steeper angle, this is going to be better for softwoods. In reality, do whatever you want. <laughs> it makes absolutely no difference. Someone will disagree with me. That's fine. <laughs> so what do those ratios mean and how do we turn those into angles that we can cut? Well, it's actually pretty simple. So first let's take a look at a one to eight ratio. What that means is for every eight inches of run, you have one inch of rise. So if I connect this point to this point, relative to the front edge of my workbench, this is angled at a one to eight ratio. And here's a bonus uh, combination square tip for you. Know the width of your blades because that can come in pretty handy. On the 12 inch combination square, the width of the blade is one inch. So that means the halfway point here is a half inch. You can kind of lay things up pretty quickly if you just happen to know that this is an inch wide. So to make this easier to see, I'm just going to drop a square line right there to make a wedge shape, and that's a one to eight. We can do the same thing for a six. I'll take my combination square down to six, and again, mark the start and stop points, connect those lines. That is a one to six ratio. So a uh, steeper, sharper angle. If you want to have some fun and do the actual math, those are the actual degrees for those rise over runs. Now, one of the kind of nice things about expressing your uh, angles as a ratio like this, you don't need a protractor to actually draw that line. As you can see, I didn't draw or set a protractor to 7.13 degrees. I just made a couple of lines, connected the dots, and that is my angle. With that being said, it is totally up to you what ratio you want to use. If you want to use a one to six, you want to use a one to eight, you want to use something crazy like a one to 7.3, you can do that. You can go even lower than that too if you want to go to like a one to four. That's also a possibility. The only one thing I'll caution you on is if you go super, super low, and you start getting into some super, super sharp and angular dovetails, you're gonna end up with a fairly weak area out here at the very tip of the tail because you have all the grain running in this direction. This becomes some pretty short grain. So as you're trying to put your dovetail together, 
you know, seating it or something, very easy to break the corners off. So just keep that in mind. This can look cool, but get ready for the possibility of having to deal with the corner falling off and then going on the floor and you lose it and you can't glue it back on and now you gotta try and piece it, a new piece in there or replace this whole part or something like that. So that's finally cautionary tale for you. So now we'll get into actually making the actual jig. So I have a piece of plywood here I'm gonna use for this. You can use literally whatever you want. The only little thing here I'll talk about real quick is gonna be the overall length of the, the jig. And this is probably gonna vary depending on the size of your bandsaw. So this one here is about uh, 13 inches long and that allows enough length back here behind the fence to grab the jig as you're working. Typically I'll hold the, uh, the jig up here and use my fingers to kind of pull it back, but it can be sometimes more convenient just to grab the backside of the jig and pull it out of there. So you want to have this thing set up so that you can actually still grab the jig while your fence is completely out of the way. So depending on how far the, I guess the front of your fence is from the front of your blade, what kind of dictate how long this thing actually has to be. And with that, we can also think about how like narrow or skinny we want this thing to be down here. On this end, I like to have a little bit of meat here so that there is something to actually grab onto. This one here is at an inch and a quarter. So that is what I'm gonna do for the, uh, the demonstration jig, or I guess the new jig that we're making. So since I already have a one to eight jig, I'm gonna do a one to six. So I have, uh, I have that one too, you know, why the heck not, I guess. <laughs> so I'm gonna come up six inches and mark that out. And I know I want to be an inch away from here, from our line. That'll be the start of the slope. So if I set my square here to two and a quarter, I'll put my intersection right here. So if I connect the starting point down here to here and keep on going, that'll be the slope or the angle for the jig. So you can see how much more drastic and steep that angle is versus the one to eight over the you know, roughly 12 inches. It's about I don't know, almost an inch difference by the time you get a foot up. So now we just need to cut that line and you can really do that however you want. You can use a track saw, you can use a miter saw, you can use a table saw, or you can do it like I'm doing is cut it on the bandsaw, just follow the line. And just like that, there is that little wedge taper thing, the heart and soul of the jig. So one thing to remember with this is the actual angle you cut on here doesn't matter that much. If it's, your, if it's a little bit off, completely irrelevant because the use of this jig is for tails first. So whatever this angle ends up being, that is what your pins are gonna get cut to. It makes no difference if this is like a 10th of a degree off or half a degree off, doesn't matter at all. My edge here is straight and flat enough that I'm not going to even bother smoothing this out since it is a little bit of this. Doesn't matter because the workpiece always references in the same place. If I have a little more material here or there that's kicking the angle out a little bit, irrelevant because the pins are gonna be cut to whatever this thing cuts onto the workpiece. So the next thing we're gonna need is some kind of little stop. And for that, I'll use a little tiny piece of hardwood and it's gonna act as a little catch or a little stop to catch the workpiece as you're running this thing through the saw. I like to have that piece around the same thickness as the angled thing. Definitely not thicker, but maybe the same thickness or just a little bit thinner. I'll install that into the end of the jig with a brass screw because sometimes I get wild and crazy and I'm waving this jig around. And if I get that screw into the blade, if it's brass, it's not gonna do anything to the blade. As far as how far past the end you want that stop to protrude, that is totally up to you. I'm gonna run it long, and then I will cut it when I actually make the first cut with this jig. So there is our completed jig all ready to go. And I thought I'd run through a quick little example here to give you an idea of how this kind of fits into the general workflow. So I'm gonna cut some dovetails on the end of this piece of mahogany that I got from my friend Aaron and uh, I have never used mahogany before. So we're gonna cut some tails. <laughs> 
So the process starts off exactly the same as you know any other kind of dovetail layout. So I'm going to describe the length of my tails that I want with my marking gauge. Now this is exactly the same as any other handish cut dovetail method. And I'm going to cut the tails on both ends. So pretending that this is a workpiece where I want the same dovetails on both ends of the board. So now I have my scribe line, I can work on my layout. And what's kind of fun about this is you don't really need to do much layout because the bandsaw and the jig kind of do that for you. So I'm going to put two tails in here. My outside ones, I know I, want, I just want to kind of clip the corner and come in. And then the only other thing I'm going to need here is a center line. So I know where to line things up for my, uh, my center pin. So there's my center line. So I'll come in here and kind of split the difference and we'll do some kind of fine tight pins. So like that's all the layout you need. And if you're doing a lot of these, you only have to get a layout on one piece because the other ones will follow suit as you're working through the process. And if you're doing like a really wide panel, you really only need to do some layout on half of it because as you're working, you'll see we're gonna be flipping the board side to side and it's gonna be mirrored. So you only need really half of the actual layout. So over to the bandsaw. So I can set up my fence to make my first cut. And since I haven't used a jig before, I'm gonna cut through my little stop here since I just want a little tiny nub of the stop left just to catch the little bit of material I'm gonna leave here. I like those fine little pins, but you can obviously set this up to make whatever width uh, pins you want. And the pins would be the space between the tails. So something like that. Let's turn on the saw and make first tail cuts. Maybe a little, little more. Flip the board. Flip the board, but the other way. <laughs> and now I can set up for that center cut. So I have my center line there. So I'm gonna set up to be kind of right in the line. So this one's gonna come over here and cut this side of the tail. And then when we flip the board over, it'll cut the, the symmetrical cut to make the other side of the other tail. And friend. Now from here, you can use whatever workflow you want to kind of proceed with your waste removal. Typically, if my, uh, my pin spacing is big enough, I'll just do that right here at the bandsaw, remove the bulk of the waste, and then all I have to do back at the bench is just chop right along the baseline. So I'll do one here real quick just to show you, and then uh, we got a board with some tails on it.
well, today I learned that mahogany is kind of weird. It's like it has that buttery property that walnut has, where with hand tools at least, they just kind of glide through and you don't get a whole lot of crushing, but you don't have to put a whole lot of like effort into cutting. It's it's very it's very weird. I, I, it's it's weird. <laughs> so at this point, we have our tails all completed and everything. So from here, I would just lay out my tails onto my pin board, cut my pins, and then fit my joint together. And that's typically how my workflow goes. I'll use the bandsaw to cut the tails, and then I'll use a handsaw to cut the pins. For whatever reason, I don't really mind handsaw cutting pins, but I find that uh, bandsaw cutting tails just happens to work better for me. That's the fun thing about hand cut dovetails is you can really do whatever you want or do it a whole bunch of different ways. The thing that I like about this the most is my favorite thing to do in the shop is the variety of ways you can get this done. So depending on my mood or what I'm kind of feeling like or if I'm feeling a little bit different, I might try a little bit of a different method that keeps it fresh and new because if you've done a lot of dovetailing before, you know that it can get kind of monotonous and boring. But if you try a different way of doing things, you perfect a technique that works for you. Maybe you explore some new way of doing things. It does keep it fresh, unique, and interesting, which I, uh, I definitely love. My process has evolved over the years, and I have several different ways to do things that will still produce really nice results, depending on uh, what I want to do, which is, uh, which is kind of fun. Now, lastly, if you do want to return to the bandsaw to cut your pins instead of hand cutting them, you can make yourself a little sled uh, jig guide thing because your bandsaw is probably not going to be able to tip this way enough to be able to hit that angle. You could hit the angle going this way, but probably not this way, and it might get a little bit tedious and obnoxious to be able to, to, have to set your bandsaw to the exact angle that whatever this thing was every single time. So you can make a quick little sled using this as uh, the basis of your sled. So I would take this and I would pattern route this exact angle, this exact edge and everything, and get an identical pair of these. That'll guarantee that the pin sled is gonna cut exactly the same angle. Couple of those, put a little platform thing on top, and that'll allow you to run your board on an angle through the blade this way, or you can spin your little sled around so you can hit the angle on the other side. So that's how you go about making that jig. I don't, I don't do that because in my case, I'm not gonna try and nail the exact pin size off the saw. I'm gonna be paring back to my scribe lines anyway. So it doesn't really matter to me how accurate my sawing is at the bench of my handsaw because I'm gonna come back with the chisel and clean it up anyway. That's the workflow that works best for me. I cannot for the life of me nail a perfect cut every time. I prefer, and in my experience, leaving a little bit of material that just Pair away real quick with the chisel is the way that works best for me. Do what you want. <laughs> Do it however you want. That's the, the fun part about this. Nothing is the wrong way. No way is wrong. The correct way is whatever way works for you, gives you the results you want, and is repeatable. That's it. <laughs> so that is maybe everything you could possibly want to know about a little taper jig thing on the bandsaw to cut some dovetails. And it's, uh, it's nice to be back in the shop. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on hand cut dovetails <laughs> or whatever you might have a question on, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.